Welcome back guys, my name's Sam, and in this week's video, I'm going to show you how to provide rescue breaths for a patient that has stopped breathing. All right guys, so today's video is all about providing artificial ventilations. Uh, before I go through some of the tools you can use to do this, I want to talk briefly about what it is exactly. So artificial ventilations are given to a patient that is apneic, which means not breathing on their own. Now this is sometimes associated with cardiac arrest, so when their heart stops, they'll stop breathing, and you have to give compressions and ventilations, or it can sometimes be on its own. So the most common example of that would be someone that overdoses on an opiate such as heroin or fentanyl, they will have their respiratory drive severely depressed and we're going to have to breathe for them. Now, on those people, if you catch it quick enough, they won't be breathing on their own, but they'll still have a pulse. And that's why the technique for this kind of varies depending what the situation is. So here are three of the tools um, that are commonly used to provide rescue breaths to a patient. I'm gonna start down here and work our way up. This is a face shield and this is probably the most common thing um, that's used by lay people to provide rescue breaths. This is also uh, the device that has the highest risk for infection um, or the spread of disease to the rescuer. And that's why I really don't use these and I don't really recommend them a whole lot. Granted, you can see how slim the form factor is here. This is really easy to put in a small kit and kind of forget about. So these are good to have, uh, but I think there are better options that you'd be better off carrying. So the face shield is a small plastic sheet that will go over the patient's face. It has little instructions on the back here you can see on how to apply it. But when you open this up, you can see this is really rudimentary. It's got a visual of a face, so that tells you exactly where to put it, and little instructions down there. So for somebody that really hasn't received a whole lot of training, this can be a pretty good option for you. This right here is a barrier to keep any um, bile or bodily fluids uh, coming in contact with your skin. Granted, this is a pretty permeable uh, cotton material here, so I'm not sure how much that will actually stop if it's really saturated with vomit or blood or something else. To use this, it's pretty simple. You have your mannequin here, and you're just gonna put the face indentation over. You're going to do what's called a head tilt chin lift, and I did cover this in my BLS airway video uh, quite a while back, so feel free to check that out, out if you wanna learn how to do some of these basic airway maneuvers. But essentially all this is, is tilting the patient's head back. And that takes the um, tongue off the back of the pharynx and will open that airway at least slightly for you. Then you're going to want to pinch the patient's nose and you're going to take your mouth and you're going to create a seal uh, over this section here. So if they're having CPR performed, it's going to be 30 compressions, two breaths. If they're apneic, we're going to give one breath every six seconds. So that would be breath, one, two, three, four, five, six, breath. And when you ventilate, you just want to ventilate enough so you see chest rise. You don't want to ventilate so much that that is just being completely expanded. You don't want to hyperinflate those lungs. Obviously, this has a high risk of infection and spreading germs, so I do not like to use these, and I really don't recommend anybody uses these um, just because of that. Now, this is better than nothing. I would never do mouth to mouth unless it was a family member or close relative that I know really, really well. Um, but I would never do mouth to mouth uh, in the field just because there's such a high risk of infection and the spread of disease. So for those cases, I prefer using a pocket mask. Now a pocket mask is a device that's a little bit more substantial. And this allows you to get complete separation and not actually come in contact with the patient while you're providing rescue breaths. There are a lot of different brands out there, but what I would make sure you have is the standard size uh, tip there that can be attached to a bag valve mask, a one-way valve to prevent anything from coming back up at you, 
and then the mask itself should be clear so you can see, visualize the airway and see if there's vomit or blood that you need to clear. This one also has an O2 port, which is a nice feature, but I don't think that's necessary for most people. So using this is a little bit more complicated. You have to create a seal with this, which can be fairly challenging. I start at the bridge of the nose, and I take this and I roll it down onto the patient's face, making sure that their mouth's encompassed inside of that. I'm then gonna take my fingers and I'm gonna make an EC. This is called an EC clamp. So my thumb and my pointer finger form the C, and these three fingers form the E. The C goes around the mask like that, and these four fingers grip under the jaw, and that gives me the ability to do a head tilt chin lift. You can take the other hand and you do the same thing, grip that just like that, form that seal, and then give your breaths. Like before, your ratio of one breath every six seconds remains the same for apneic patients, or two breaths every 30 compressions. This is probably the best option for single rescuer uh, rescue breaths because it's fairly easy to do. You can devote both your hands to creating a seal, and it's really easy to put on. If you're doing 30 compressions, then you come over to the head, you can put this on and be ready to go in just a couple seconds to minimize time off the chest. It's also very safe for you because you have this one-way valve. However, it is not foolproof. And we still do not use these in the professional setting very often. So in the professional setting, we're gonna be using bag valve masks. Now these offer the lowest risk of uh, infection from the patient, and they also give us the ability to give a high concentration of oxygen to those patients. In both uh, the face shield and the pocket mask, we're only giving them about 16% oxygen because that's about all we expire. Um, but with this, we can give them up to 100% if we have an O2 tank present. So this is the pocket BVM, and this is a very compact bag valve mask. I use this in all my kits. It's a great device. Generally speaking, uh, hospitals will have the full BVM and it won't be compact at all and you can see how this would not fit in a kit very well. So if you're looking to carry a bag valve mask, I would carry something like this. It's a lot more compact, it's protected in this case and it is really high quality. So link for these is down in the description below. Now to open this, we just pull the cap off and the BVM comes out. You can see this one comes with some O2 tubing. If we do have a tank, um, we can connect that to it. If you're just a lay person and you're not going to have an O2 tank, then you can actually get this uh, without this option. It's just a little bit cheaper. Once it's expanded, you can see it's roughly the same as the other bag you saw. Um, and the technique for this is very similar to the pocket mask. Now, I will tell you that the American Heart Association uh, says you should not be doing this if you're on your own and you're not a professional rescuer. And even if you are professional, they recommend always having two people uh, to use this because it is more taxing and it does require a lot of practice. Uh, so that's, that's my warning for this. Now I do this enough where I can get a very good seal and ventilate very effectively with the bag valve mask. Uh, so that's generally what I choose to carry and use in my kit. And then I'm also usually around other healthcare professionals that can also assist me if need be. To make a seal around a patient's face with this mask, you're still gonna be using the EC technique. So I've got the C and the E. I'm gonna put this on the bridge of their nose, rotate down. I can grip and then grip under the patient's jaw and pull back. Now you can see this is a lot harder to get that seal because I've got nobody over on this side creating that seal. So when I do that, I usually take the bag and I press it down slightly on that side to get a seal all the way around the patient's mouth. And then we're going to squeeze the bag only until we see chest rise. We don't want to hyperinflate their lungs. This is a pretty big reservoir, so we don't need to keep this all the way uh, deflated when we give them a breath, only until we see that chest rise. All right, so for a quick recap, rescue breaths are used in two main situations, and the first is going to be if somebody's in cardiac arrest, you're going to be giving two rescue breaths every 30 compressions. The second is going to be if somebody's apneic, which means if they're not breathing. If somebody's not breathing but they still have a pulse, we're going to give one rescue breath every six seconds. When you give a rescue breath, it should last about one second for each breath, and you're only going to give enough air to see the chest rise. You don't want to hyperinflate the lungs.
If you have questions about anything I've talked about today, please leave them in the comments down below. Um, I've left links to all of these products down in the description so you can check those out, and I will see you next week. Thank you.